you, Jay, and the worship team. Let's just, in this attitude of thanksgiving, how many are grateful for the cross? The cross is the means that God used to shed his innocent blood, the ultimate sacrifice himself, the giving of himself fr freely and willfully because he first loved us even while we were yet sinners. And he went to that cross and he shed his blood because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so that which separated us from God was wiped away because of his work, his finished work on the cross. Father, we're so forever grateful that you did first love us. No, it wasn't us that sought you out. It was you that sought us out. Lord, it was your Holy Spirit that drawed us to you, that re re revealed your, yourself to us, that your great light shone on, on our darkness, uh, our, our sin, and that which was separating us. And Lord, you, you, you stretched out your arms and you said, come unto me. And so, Lord, I thank you for that holy conviction, Lord, that, that, that loving conviction that draw, drew us to you, Lord. And, Lord, through our godly sorrow, we realized that we needed to repent. We needed to turn, have a change of mind, go in a new direction. And, Lord, in doing so, you gave us not, not just new direction, but new life. Lord, reborn, born again, our spirit comes alive. And we are now reconciled with you. And it's your very presence that lives in us and abides with us. And, and if, we will, if we will pause to open our ears, we will hear that leading voice that has already ordered steps, Lord. And we pray that your will that is already established in heaven is carried out for us here as we walk it out on earth in total and complete humble submission and surrender to you. Lord, we are grateful for the cross. We're grateful that that you first loved us, and we're grateful to be in your house, worshiping in your presence here this morning. We praise you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. Great to see everyone in the house of God this morning. And uh, I'm excited to uh, move, move forward as we continue to take steps, thanks, Kayla, to get back to at least where we were, and then move forward and do whatever God is asking us to do. And so uh, along with kids, kids ministry, um, uh, restarting here on Labor Day uh, weekend, also uh, full worship team back, and uh, just they've been doing a great job, haven't they? Just uh, they lead us into the throne room of grace and into God's presence, and it's so important. It's, it's why we come. It's one of the reasons why we come and gather, that we might be in in his presence. Uh, so today, uh, I wanna, I'm going to be emphasizing three things. Three things. The times that we're living in, the need to gather, and most importantly, that we gather in unity. The times that we're in, gathering together and gathering in unity. Uh, as I was seeking God as to what to share, um, what was most prominently on my heart, which I don't know how the heart and mind and all that works, you know, uh, but what, what I could not get out of my thought pattern was, was the times that we're in and how the consequences and the effects of it have, have caused a scattering. And, and, and it's really what brought me focused on, thank you, man, I'm getting taken care of like... Thank you. Thank you, Don. And so, really, I began to think about what the state of the church and how there's no better time than to be absolutely sure about what the state of the church is. Not just this church, but the church, capital, capital C Church. And I don't think any elaboration is needed to say 2020 has been quite a year. 2020 has been... <laughs> quite a year. Uh, there's this COVID-19 thing in general. And although there's been past epidemics and pandemics and other world events, I, in my lifetime, and over five decades now, I have never seen anything impact the church, at least here in America, or the church that I'm a part of, in the way that this, this, thing, this thing has. And, and so myself, along with other pastors that I regularly talk with and meet with and, 
and uh, really all over all over the country we have this we have been concerned about the state of the church and we're especially concerned about the current state of the American church as I'll speak for especially in light of all that has been going on this year the governing authorities uh, uh, decisions regarding this public health matter since what late February or uh, early March and uh, our and I'll be included in this our polarizing responses to those decisions and 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 uh, decisions that we need to make really for the benefit of uh, of everybody and determine what's best for for all of us and so most churches as as you know went online but we we as collective pastors found out that not all of our people were joining with us in that brief transition and then most of the churches came back to gathering again and we've also can see that not everyone has has returned as yet and so what I'm speaking to is I mentioned I'm speaking to the impact that this year has had on scattering the church we've got our general public matters and then we all have the reality of dealing with our personal matters I can relate to that I personally have been I've been called to be a pastor and shepherd Stonebridge Church and so this year with that in mind uh, first quarter of 2020 I was on a sabbatical really grateful for that and then when I came back I got to jump right into this mess of what were the COVID restrictions and then uh, a little bout with shingles that, that was a good time and uh, continuing to work through things. And then uh, Julie and I and, and, and Zach contracted the COVID, the dreaded COVID-19 ourselves, along with my, my parents had gone through it. So I appreciate God allowing me to go through things so that I can understand things better, maybe empathize with other. My first week back, I was welcomed back with, a, with a, some friendly wasps out back that just attacked my hand and swelled it up and made it go numb. That was a, that was a nice, nice return back after recovering from uh, being in bed for a, practically three weeks with the COVID. And then, uh, as many of you know here, we joined with my son and now daughter-in-law in, uh, in, in, their, in their wedding. Um, it's not easy doing weddings. I don't know if me, some of you maybe have forgotten, some of you might not know, uh, but weddings, weddings are a big, a big deal. And then, uh, lingering and back issues and I listen I, I don't like John I really don't it's not my favorite thing to do to be up in front of people I'm just being faithful to a call of God in my life and I don't like drawing tension myself but I, I know this the enemy knows that if the shepherd is struck down the sheep will scatter yeah, that's right. I've always known if you want to kill something go for the head you cut the head off the rest of the body will follow suit. Jesus brought this out when he was referring to Zechariah's prophecy when he was talking before he was going to the cross. He told these faithful, faithful disciples of his that followed him for these three, three and a half, half years saying, you guys are going to scatter. And they couldn't believe it. And even now I look at this, I can't believe how the church is scattered in the midst of what has gone on in this, this 2020. But I am grateful what God is bringing us through. I'm grateful what God's bringing my family through. I'm grateful what God's bringing Stonebridge Church through. I'm grateful for what God is bringing the church, the universal church through as, we, as he, he's never, never left us. He's never uh, not known exactly what, we, what position we're in and, and what we've got to go through. And I believe this, that whatever that God allows us to go through today is preparing us for what is coming tomorrow. That's, I, 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 I've known that to be true. I've actually lived it and experienced it. And so those are the times that we're living in. And so before I get to that, my, really my main point of drawing together in unity, I want to talk about gatherings. Let's go to a familiar passage in Hebrews, way back here in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 10, just a couple of verses. Hebrews 10, verses 23 24 and 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Has he proved to be faithful to you through a few things? He who has promised to, is faithful. 
and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Now this ties and will flow right into what we're talking about with unity and what we're talking about being gathering and, and togetherness. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. You see, this passage is filled with doing things with each other. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Of course, that day is capitalized. It's not just any day. It's the day. It's the end of this present age. It's when Jesus is coming back. And I believe I've heard this my whole life, and we've been, he, he's been uh, prophesying this for over 2,000 years. Jesus is coming back soon. And these times are revealing that day is nearing closer and closer and closer. There's very few prophecies biblically that need to be fulfilled for those skies to break, that trumpet to sound, and for Jesus to call those that are in the grave to life, and we will be joining them in the air. That day is so, so soon. Now, church attendance was actually plummeting before 2020. This is no great news. I came across a study by Barna Research, and this is recent. This came out in March of this year, March of this year. And they, they, they have three groups that they were looking at. Let me just tell you these three groups. Practicing Christians, we all realize that just because someone says they're a Christian, that can mean many things. And so they define these. Practicing Christians, non-practicing Christians, <laughs> kind of an oxymoron there, I guess, but but we, 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 we got to call it like it is, right? And then non-Christians. And so let me just give some brief definitions. Practicing Christians, they, they identify as Christians. They, they find their faith. It, it's very important to them. And they had attended a church service in the last month. Not once a month. They had at least attended a church service in the last month. That's a practicing Christian. Non-practicing Christian, I know that you're all wondering what, what, what in the world that is. Now, they're self-identified as Christians, but they uh, don't qualify as practicing, meaning their faith is not very important to them, and they hadn't been to a church service in the last month. And then lastly, we have non-Christians, people that simply don't identify as being a Christian. What this study showed is that the amount of practicing Christians has declined every year the last 19 years. And from 2000 to now 2020, there are about half as many practicing Christians as there was 19 years ago. This is the American church. And so in 2000, it is, was, was estimated that 45% of the U.S. population were at least claimed to be practicing Christians. Today, one in four. 25% of U.S. population claimed to be a practicing Christian. And the attendance for those graduating high school, entering adulthood, the decline of those numbers are even higher. That should be extremely concerning to all of us as practicing Christians, not just pastors. Not surprisingly, both Bible reading and prayer in these last 19 years have also declined drastically. I, and you, and I, I, we don't have to look very hard to step back and look at the parallels of the moral decline of this nation in the last two decades. And I guarantee you it has something to do with these statistics that I'm just talking to you about. Prayer and Bible study, it's, they seem so basic, but they've been so prevalent on my heart since I've come back from sabbatical. I love, what, I love what the great 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon said when someone asked him, Pastor, what is more important, prayer or reading the Bible? He said, let me ask you what is more important to you, breathing in or breathing out? It's a very lifeline of a practicing Christian to be in prayer, communication with the Lord, not just petitioning Him with what we want, but having the time to listen to what He has to say to us because He will let us know what we need and then He will supply that need in His good, in his good timing. And so in my mind, as, as a, really not just as a pastor but a fellow Christ follower, I said, how, how, can, how can this possibly be? How can we, we be where we're at? People, do you realize people used to come to the house of God just to hear the reading of God's word for hours? Oh, this is, this is a, we're in a new day, Pastor. You know, that's the same thing that they say about why we should swallow homosexual, uh, homosexuality, 
why we should be okay with pro-choice. They use the same excuse that people are using. As I just said, well, it's a, it's a whole other day, Pastor. I don't care what day it is, yesterday, today, or tomorrow, people are going to be people. God will always be God. And this word will always stand and it will always be a, a truth that we can stand on and proclaim and, 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 and receive its promises. Even today, amazingly, even today, I'll go outside of America. There are people, and I, I know this firsthand in talking to some of our missionaries, there are people that will walk for days, that's plural, just to attend a church service. And then, yeah, they got to walk days back home. I don't know if that's your whole life is just walking to and from church. I mean, there's only seven days in a week. But that is a lifestyle of some here in America. As I've experienced this and talking with my other pastors, we have to be world-class communicators. Come up with these creative ways to to keep people's attention and to have you engage in, 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 in this brief discussion or message. I don't even know if we can call them sermons anymore. But all of these things, I, I've recognized, they're, they're, they're paralleling, they're right next to a, an American church that has, has been in decline in an American country that has lost its moral bearings. This country's off the rails because we have foregone these these. these things that were established by our, our founding fathers, regardless of what those say, trying to rewrite history. Right? We all know here in this room that you can't believe everything you hear, right? You do know you can't believe everything you hear, right? Thank God. There's hope for us. And so, of course, I, I encourage the personal time of prayer and Bible study and family devotions, and as well as gathering, come together in our corporate time times of prayer, personal prayer, corporate prayer, our Bible studies and, and life groups as we continue to grow those this fall. But it's becoming more obvious year by year, God is returning soon for his bride. He's, Paul wrote in Ephesians that, that he, Jesus, might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she be holy and without blemish. John goes on to write in Revelation, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife, the church, that's you and I, has made herself ready. So saints, let's make sure we are making ourselves ready for the inevitable return of Jesus Christ. And so we understand the times that we're in. And we not only need to assemble and gather together, but my main point this morning is we need to thrive in unity. Not barely make it, not survive, but we need to thrive in unity. Let's go to 2 Timothy. Just back up a couple of uh, little books. I think Philemon and Titus are between Hebrews and 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and uh, I'm going to read uh, verses 14 to 16, and then we're going to jump down to verses 22 through 26. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. It says, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Let's jump down to verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, Love, peace, this is an important word here, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, and humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. I truly believe this. I think there are people, there are people that are flat out in satanic worship, and they worship Satan as you and I worship Jesus Christ. They're, that's a reality. It's, it's happening. It's taking place. It's probably more prevalent than we... It is more prevalent than we realize, and probably more prevalent than we want to admit. But I think there's a whole host of others that don't even realize that because they are separated from God, they're simply pawns of the enemy of your soul and, and, and my soul. Quiet on the set. 
I know those of you that have seen this, maybe on social media, you've been wondering for 48 hours, what in the world is this about have to do with church? Quiet, quiet on the set. Well, we all know, I, I think we all know, but when, you, when you're filming a, a movie, there's, there's a director, and he gets to determine when the, the, there, there's a start and the end into what is called scenes. And when you hear quiet on the set, you know that a scene is about to, to begin, or, or that there's going to be another what's called take of that scene so that it can come to a completion. And sometimes when the scene is not going as the director sees fit, he gets to say, cut! And they, uh, they snap that little, uh, you know, I want to I get one of those just to do it. If I, I should have anticipated more. I think you can get them for like three bucks on, online. Are they little clapboards? Where's Nate? What are they called? Is it a clapboard? It's a clapboard. Of course, Nate knows what a clapboard is. You know, scene, I don't know what scene we're in. Scene 647, take 53. Snap. Right? That's what God gets to do with our lives. I, I, I was thinking about as I was studying this week. And so my, my metaphor is as, as we go through times in life, seasons and, and events, we're referring to those as scenes in our life. And 2020 has been quite a scene. I'm ready for this scene to come to a conclusion, and, and I know that everybody that I talk to is as well. But I believe that our ultimate director of the scene uh, of, of our life has, has already yelled out, cut, cut. I've said this before, in God's sovereignty, he either causes or allows every detail to take place in your life and my life. Collectively, this world's place, every, every detail. He's not taken by surprise by any one thing. He either causes or allows. And it is, it is his sovereignty and his omniscience and his omnipotence that he has the ability to say cut. And I believe that he has said cut when he is speaking. Again, now he's speaking to his church. Because those that don't know him, that are separated by sin, they're not hearing the voice of God. Hopefully they're being drawn by the Holy Spirit. But they're not hearing God's voice. They're not being led by God's voice. And they're certainly not walking into obedience. I believe that he's already said cut, and now I think he is saying this. Quiet on the set. Because I believe God is going to start a beginning a new thing going forward. This has not just happened just for the sake of happening. What we are going through now is preparing us for what is coming in a day ahead. And so when that director yells out, quiet on the set, there is there's no noise of any kind. There's no talking, not even, not even whispering. There's no cell phones, not even on vibrate. And there's no moving around. It's best to stay right where you are until that take of that scene gets back to a cut, which could mean that it's completed, it's finished, the director is satisfied. This is, this is, this is, what, this, this is what I had planned. This, this is my will that, that has been carried out. And so let me, let, me, let me clarify this metaphor as it relates to this church in case some of you may be wondering, why are we bringing that movie industry into the church? Listen, this, so this, 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 this is not a stage, this is a platform. These musicians and singers up here, they're not performers, they're worshipers. Right? I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm a teacher of God's word and a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you are not an audience. You are members, if you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're members of a, of a body, the body of Christ. We are family. We, we have been grafted together as one, all members of one body, serving one God for one purpose, and it's his, not ours. Yes, Quiet on the set. I, I love definitions, as you know, and so I went to the Collins Dictionary, and I love these Quiet is characterized by an absence of noise. It's an absence of turbulent motion or disturbance. It's free from anger, impatience, and other extreme emotions. It's free from pretentiousness or, or vain displays. It's, it's a state of being silent or untroubled. It's peaceful. It's calm. It's tranquil. I, I, I need quiet in my life on August 16th of 2020. And no doubt this year 
being an election year, I know that it's added some major implications to it all. And we're just a few months away of determining the course of direction for this country. It's the way that things work. And we've got more back and forth rhetoric that's going on. We've got social media links that never stop to, to this expert on this subject. And, 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 and of course, everybody knows better than the next person, right? And all of this, that's just, take, that's just in the church. That's just with the people in the church. I even, even address those people in the world because I've shut them out and I've shut them off and I don't, I don't listen to them because I don't care what they say. What they say has no bearings on, on, on who I am or my life or my direction or what my, my God, my director says, what my role is in this next scene of my life. Proverbs 17, 28 says, even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. And when he shuts his lips, he is... He's considered perceptive. I love that quote. I think it's attributed to Mark Twain. I've tried to use this as I get older, and it's quite effective, actually. It's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. Right. My point is, they're not, nobody really knows what it's all about, what, what is taking place, what's going to happen, except God, except our director, unless he instructs us, unless he informs us, unless he tells us. And we have to have our ears. We, we have to be in, in relationship with him and in communicating with him so that we can hear what he is saying. So he says, you see that step I've ordered, I want you to step into it, and I want you to step into it now by faith. Because I've called you to it, and if, if I've called you to it, I'm going to be sure to see you through it. It's the voice, the voice of the Lord. So God's saying, quite on the set, and I know that he's getting ready for another take here in the church, you and I, we need to be ready. Now, now please don't misunderstand as I brought the dreaded politics into it. I, I do believe we need to do our part. We need to live out our God-given freedoms that... that this great nation has given us. We need to stand for truth and righteousness. And I think we need to take part. We need to vote. We need to vote for those that stand to honor God and biblical principles. It's really not complicated if you're a practicing Christian. But no matter, let me just fast forward to November 4th. No matter who wins this election, God is still God. And we're still the church. And I'm still going to receive my marching orders from him. Amen. No matter what. It's God. Not Trump. Certainly not Biden. It's God who ultimately is going to determine the timing of what is to come. And so, so, so I and, and Pastor Chad in these last couple of weeks on this platform, we've talked about this. What, 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 are, what is our focus? What are we looking for? What and where are the battles that we're, that we're fighting? Are, are we being the church? Are we bearing witness to God? Fulfilling this, his greatest commandments and, and the great commission. And so if the church is going to be that bride, he's coming back for and to carry out our mission. And so the three quick points of unity. We need to, first of all, we need to be united with God. We need to be united with God. John 17, verses 21 through 23 It says that they all may be one. They is you and me. It's us. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. It's part of our witness, right? Verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. We have to be united with God. Our faith is so much more than just a belief and a confession. It's based on, on a loving conviction that, that we recognize that came from, from the Lord. Godly sorrow, as I, I, I pray, to true repentance, surrendering our will and giving our whole hearts to God. I think we could qualify practicing Christians just a little more. It's those that have sen- surrendered 100% of their lives to God. He's an all-or-nothing God. He's a jealous God. And he's either all, he's either all of our God or he's not God at all. And so even then, even when doing that, as you all well know, if 
you are, have been walking your life out as a practicing Christian that there's still a whole lot of carnality, flesh that we have to deal with, a lot of, a lot of ourselves that still needs to die. And, and recognizing that and submitting to God, it'll take place. It's called sanctification. It's the walk that we're walking as the Holy Spirit is leading. If you're allowing the transforming of that Holy Spirit to transform you into his likeness, that's what's taking place. We have to be united with God. So we're united with God. We also need to be united with each other. We need to, we need to recognize the day in which we are living, that day that is fast approaching, and, and assemble those, we've got empty seats. We've got lots of space where more people could assemble here and gather here so that they can be one with us, so that they can be encouraged and, and equipped and edified. And we are a part of that to reach out and do that. You look at the people next to you, make sure that you're being an encouragement to them. People that are not here that could be here and are, are not, we need to reach out to them. They're part of the body of Christ. They're part of the family of God. We need to, we need to do our, our part in that. And so united one with another. Paul writes about this in Ephesians chapter 4. Again, just some of these, some of these verses. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. One, 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 grafted together as one by the Spirit. That's a capital S, by the Holy Spirit. He does, does, that, does that for us. What is, it that, what is it that binds us together? The Holy Spirit, of course, but... What is it that melds us and, and bonds us? The Bible speaks over and over about it. It's, it's, it's love. It's love. Think about it in every, in every aspect of, of, of love defined. For a lost sinner needing to be reconciled to God, it's the agape love, God's unconditional love of mankind. For a man and a woman to become a married couple, it's the eros love, that passionate love. For a healthy parent and child relationship, it's called storge love. And for two individuals to form a true friendship, for you and I to be bound together as brothers and sisters in Christ, that's the filial love, right? Friends, we're equals. Brotherly love. I'm going to just touch on something, uh, that, uh, a brief um, bit of information that was sent to me by one of my pastor friends. He pastors down in Houma, Louisiana. And... And it gives us a contrast of what it is to be bound together and bound together in love. And it has to do with, again, the times that we're living in and the technology that has become so prevalent in all of our lives. And so the digital age's technological advances, they boast three major contributions to the supposed improvement of society or the human experience, which in turn have become its undeniable value. Speed, choices, and individualism. Speed, choices, and individualism. Speed, we have access to what we want when we want as quickly as our fingers can type or scroll. Choices, we have access to an endless array of options when it comes to just about anything. And the one I want to focus on is individualism. Everything from online profiles to gadgets, and uh, 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 all customizable, allowing us to emphasize our preference, our personalities. It just, feed, it just really feeds the me, myself, and I perspective. And while these contributions have added some comfort and conveniences to parts of our lives, the added value is coming at a great cost. As our collective desire for and, and devotion to this tech, digital technology, it becomes increasingly excessive and particularly in the ways that these digital technologies has influenced the church. Many of us, many of us can relate to this because even good things have dark sides when taken to their extremes. And sadly for so many, that's exactly what's happening. These once positive contributions of the digital of age have resulted in what is becoming our undoing. The speed of the digital age has made us impatient. 
Oh, I can relate to that. Just, I've been noticing this lately. Why is it taking my computer so long to fire up? This is ridiculous. You know, now within 30 seconds, I've got everything that I need. Right? I got to pull into a drive-through lane, and there's 10 cars in there. Said, so, oh my, I got to wait in this drive-through. How long do I got to wait in this drive-through? A drive-through? Are you kidding me? We got people living in other parts of the world. They're hoping they get their ration of water and some and, 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 a, and, a, and a dirt sandwich for crying out loud. I love God. I love what he loves. He loves the church. He loves his bride. I love the church. I love you. I'm, I'm here serving you because I love you. And we get caught up in the busyness of our culture and our society and we, we begin to be, our, our senses are dull and we're not aware of these things that are taking place, not just around us, but to us and collectively as the church. So the speed is making us impatient. The choices of this age have made us shallow. And the individualism of this digital age, here's the dangerous part, has made us isolated. Completely con contradicting what the Word of God says about assembling and gathering and doing with one another and loving one another. And I'm not saying that we can't be ourselves. God made us unique. We, we all know that. But even in our, our uniqueness, God has called us to become one and to do it together. We're members of a body, bodies that are individuals. 1 John 4, 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Let's be aware of what our circumstances around us, what they're, what they're causing, what the consequences of them are. Lastly, we're united to God, we're united to each other, and really we're united to be his witness. We're united to be his witness. Jesus never said that the world will know him by our, our prosperous lives or our big churches or, or our, our miracles or even how much we pray and read the Bible. He, he didn't say that. What he said was, is, is found in John 13, 34 through 36. John chapter 13, verses 34 through 36, our last passage. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one one another. And by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. The New Living Translation says, verse 35, this way, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Being united with God and being united with each other is part of fulfilling the great commission that God, I believe, keeps us around for. Why, why else are we still here? If we know him, he knows us. Our destinies in, in that are inevitable and sure, and that is to find heaven our home. He's left us here that we would love one another, not just one another here, but even those that are outside of the body of Christ, as Jesus even says, to love our enemies. I really believe one reason the church is not more influential than it has been is because our focus has been off. It's, it's gotten too self-centered and not enough Christ-centered. We can't, we just can't make the greatest act of love and something trivial like we talked about, we sang about that just before I came up. The cross. To make that all about living a, a happy, blessed life now, trivial, ridiculous. We need to make it about more, more than that. We need to make it about what it is. It's so all men may come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's for us to fulfill the Great Commission. And we do it by being united to, get, to God, of course, to be united together as the body of Christ, as the church, so that we can let the world know who he is. Knowing Jesus does more than impact our life here for the better. It completely changes our life here and, of course, fulfills a promise that in that life hereafter. I love this quote by a man named Steve Lawson. He says, if Jesus has not changed your life, the Jesus you met is another Jesus. We need to be aware that there is another gospel that gets preached 
today. We need to be aware that they're, 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 they're talking about another Jesus. If they're not talking about the Jesus that went to the cross, bled, suffered, bled, and died for you and I, and then asked us to surrender our wills, to lay down our lives, to pick up our, our cross, to be sold out to, in relationship to him, 100%. Because this world is not our home. And so I think the church needs to stop living like it is. We're just passing through. It's not about living our best life now. It's about following Jesus and our mission and ultimately to our home when our time, when this scene, the scene of this life is completed. Let's not allow the circumstances of our day deter us from being the church. Let's stand this morning. Let's be sure that we're continuing to gather together for worship. Let's encourage others to come and meet to hear the word of God, to become equipped for the work of the ministry. Let's encourage and edify one another with, with the wholesome fellowship that, that he asks us to. Let's, let's be willing to minister to one another in love and, and in prayer. That's what the church is. Psalm 133, 1 says how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Unity. And so we'll stay united in relationship with God. And as his Holy Spirit continues to draw us to himself, we're going to live according to the purposes that he has called us to. We'll be sure that we are united with one another, not allowing ourselves to become isolated. Or if we recognize someone else becoming isolated, reach out to them. Bring them in. Bring them into the to what is known as the family of God. And we'll walk in the bonding love of the Holy Spirit to show the world who he really is. I'm so grateful that he has said quite on the set. I truly believe he is, he is starting a new work. He needs the church to step up and do a new work in our, in our sphere of influence here in America. God's called us to this. And as, as if we stay united to him, united with each other, we'll be able to do just that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that is not just the sure foundation that we stand on, but continually reminds us and guides us and directs us. And as we receive it and apply it to our own hearts, minds, and lifestyle, it, 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 it changes us, it transforms us. Thank you for the power of the word of God. Lord, as you speak to us, Lord, I pray that our hearts are soft and malleable and open to you. Lord, that those, those that make that effort to come out to the church to hear the word of God, I pray that they wouldn't be offended, but they'd rather be convicted, Lord, as you, as you draw us to yourself. And so I pray for each and every one here this morning. I pray that our convictions become surrenders. And Lord, that our weaknesses in you, they're made strong. I pray that you would Meet people at their point of need. You know what they are even better than we do ourselves. I know there's many needs represented here because there's people here. And as people, we'll always have these needs. But there are needs that, they're, they're spiritual needs, like emotional needs, mental health issues, physical health issues. God, I pray that you, that you got our attention, you've captivated our attention, and, and we're looking to you and calling on you. I pray, Lord, that in your and your goodness, Lord, and, and your timing, your will is done, Lord, that you meet these needs. Lord, do the, do the work that you intend to do as we walk with you and live life being led by you. And you, ful you fulfill those, those desires of our heart that ultimately come from you. God, we thank you for that. We thank you for, the, for this new call, this, this new take of the scene of 2020 as we enter into the end, end of this year and, and important times Father, our eyes are fixed on you and we call on the name that's above every name. Father, we bless you and we thank you for this. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Jay, lead us in a, in a song. <laughs>